There was no impact as such. It was just like jamming your brakes on a car. And uh, that was that. She stopped. We had a porthole open, and I looked out, and the sky was clear, the stars were shining, the sea was dead calm. And I thought, I don't know, I couldn't understand it. So I came out of my cabin and I thought, well, I'll go forward. And I went forward to the well deck on the starboard side and I could see ice in the well deck. There's no sign of iceberg then, because she'd passed us. And the lights were shining on the water from the portholes. And there was no sign of damage above water line. And of course, what had happened, we slipped over the iceberg. And although she was supposed to be unsinkable with a double bottom, the iceberg had cut her from forward on the starboard side to the engine room, almost amidships, right through her two bottoms. And we had orders to get the lifeboats out. And of course the order, the same old order, women and children. And we swung the lifeboats out and gradually filled them up. First boats were on the port side, the first boats away didn't have many passengers on board. They were afraid to go down. There was a 70-foot drop to the water, and they didn't think she was going to sink. And a few of the first boats on the port side got away with half-filled. Don't forget, we had 16 lifeboats, and uh, they each carried 50. And if they'd been filled, we could have saved 800, whereas we only saved 500. So you can imagine there were many seats in the first lifeboats, vacant. Um, then I had orders to uh, go down the storeroom with a gang of men and get all the biscuits we could find. Well, when we got back up onto the boat deck, we couldn't get near the lifeboats. Some people were scrambling to get in and being pushed back. By that time, she was listing very badly to port, and we couldn't get the starboard boots down. But before I got my life belt on, I met a, a young couple, and uh, I can tell you her name. It was a Mrs. Clark. They'd spent their honeymoon in France, and we'd picked them up at Cherbourg. And uh, she, she was having trouble with her life belt. So I fixed that on to her, and I said, I think you'd better get into a lifeboat. And there was one in the port, on the port side. So she said, no, she said, I don't want to go there. I don't want to leave my husband. So I said, well, it's just precautionary measure. You get in, your husband will follow later on. And I got her away, and that was that. And then I picked up my own life belt and put it on. Well, things went there, and... and uh, then the third-class passengers were coming up. There were 700 of them, and they swarmed the decks and filled up the decks. And I thought, well, I'd done all I possibly could. I'd helped them all I could. And I thought, well, now I'll uh, go up and get out of all this scrumming and go on the poop deck. And she was sinking past then. And all of a sudden, she lifted up quickly, and you could hear everything crashing through her. Everything that was movable was going through her. And then she went down and seemed to come up again. So I thought, well, now I'm going to leave. And uh, I was hanging on to a board. We had two boards, starboard and port, which said, keep clear of propeller blades. And I was hanging on to one of these, and I was getting higher and higher in the air, and I thought, well, now I'll go, and I dropped in. I had a light built on, and I hit the water with a terrific crack. And luckily, I didn't hit anything when I dropped in. There were bodies all over the place. And then I looked up at the Titanic. So the propellers were right out of water, the rudder was right out, and I could see the bottom. And then gradually, she glided away, and that was that. That was the last of the Titanic. I didn't want to die, I mean, and I didn't see much chance of living, but I was gradually getting frozen up. And um, by the grace of God, I came across a lifeboat, and they pulled me in. 
and there was a fireman dead in the bottom, and there was about a foot of water in this boat. There, were, um, there was another man who, try, who was trying to, he seemed to be trying to get away from it again. I don't know what was the matter with him. They were tying, tying him down. And the rest were women and children. And I, I sat on a seat and uh, who should be, I sat next to Mrs. Clark, the, the, the girl I'd put into a lifeboat. And she said, uh, the first thing she said, where's my, have I seen my, have you seen my husband? So I said, no, I haven't, but I expect he'll be all right. Anyway, I was pretty, in a pretty bad way then, as you can imagine, frozen solid almost. And she wrapped me round with a cloak. She had some sort of blanket or a coat on. Anyway, I think uh, she probably saved my life, I don't know. But uh, I saved hers. At least I think I might have done, I think I did. And she saved mine. Then, first light, the uh, Carpathia came along. The Carpathia was about 7,000 tons, and they were going to the Mediterranean, absolutely loaded. And uh, they took us all on board, took us to New York. And that was that. Captain Roskin was knighted for his job. He did a damn good job, too. I believe you've even got a watch that you were wearing at the time when you went into the water. Yes, yes. Oh, but and it's only your old gunmetal watch. But uh, I couldn't afford anything better in those early days. Here it is. This what one does it need? show us? That says 20 past two. What time was it when you went into the water, do you think? I think about two o'clock. I think it lasted. It was frozen up like I was. I think it lasted for about 20 minutes in the water. Does talking about this incident bother you like you have been today? Talking about it? I should probably dream of that tonight. Have another nightmare. <laughs> You'd think I'm too old for that, but you'd be amazed. You lie in bed at night and the whole thing comes round again.